here. All right. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Monica McCubrey and this is the science of and today we're going to be talking about body covering. So um, different animals have different characteristics and different um, things when you touch them or look at them. And so we're going to really dive in today and talk about what makes them different and how they're different and what are they used for and why do they have them. So all those really cool questions. So um, before we get going, um, I do want to have my co host introduce herself. So I will let her take the reins. Hi, thanks, Monica. My name is Laura. Um, I'm a wildlife education assistant um, out in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. I work in partnership with Monica and uh, the Game and Parks through the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Um, it's a nonprofit organization based out of Colorado where we focus on conservation of bird species through education, um, stewardship with private landowners, and um, science like research um, monitoring and stuff. So happy to be here. Happy to learn more about body coverings and help Monica out. All right, thanks, Laura, and thanks again for moderating. So um, while we're talking today, if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to either message. Um, you can either privately message Laura in the chat and she can help you out, or you can go ahead and just put your question in the chat. Um, odds are that if you have a question, maybe someone else has that same question and they would like that answered as well. So um, we'll kind of pause at some places here today to answer those questions and 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 maybe have some good discussion. So uh, we will go ahead and get started. Like I talked about today we're talking all about body covering so we're going to talk a lot about different types of animals today so i'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and i'll get the the good view for you here maybe my computer is weird i have to do this like 10 times all right hopefully everyone sees the big uh, body covering, not the presenter view, hopefully. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. All right. So like we talked about today, we're talking about um, body covering. So uh, we're going to go ahead and dive in here um, for our first thing. Really quickly, I do want to just uh, reiterate to people, if you haven't joined us before on a science of, um, just remember that the comments that you make or um, if your video is on, just make sure that everything's going A-OK -okay and everything's appropriate and that you keep the comments to the um, the topic in question. So um, I'm sure that we won't have any problems, but if we do for some reason, um, we do have the right to remove you. So, but again, I'm sure we will not have any issues today. All right, so before we get started on talking about different types of animals, I wanna just do a little introduction about what body coverings are and why animals have them. All right, so when you look at an animal, one of the main things that you learn from the very start of um, being in school is that they have different body coverings. So this might be, um, different characteristics that completely set them apart from each other. Um, one of the main things that you're always taught is how do you tell if an animal is a mammal? Well, they have hair or fur. How do you know if something is a bird? Well, they have feathers. Um, so all of those different animals have something that makes that group or that characteristic very special. And it helps us identify animals based on those characteristics. So uh, for instance, if I find an animal and I have no idea what it is, um, but it has, um, let's say really dry, maybe some little bumps on it, I might think that those are scales and it could be a reptile. Or if I find this animal here that I've pictured, this is a Luna moth. Um, if I ever find this on a fence post and I'm like, oh my gosh, what is this thing? Um, one of the main things that we can help identify those is using those body coverings. So um, this guy kind of looks a little fuzzy. He is green. Um, if I went up and touched him, he might be really soft. He might be really bumpy. I'm not sure. So identifying those animals based on those body coverings is a huge, um, easy way to identify animals. So what are the purpose of all these different body coverings? So every living animal um, has some type of covering on its body to protect it from its environment or even to live in their environment. Um, one of the main things is for defense. Uh, so the photo I have here, if anyone can guess or you wanna put it in the chat, uh, what you think those are. Um, the, a lot of times um, 
animals have something for defense. Um, for instance, porcupine quills, which if you um, already put it in the chat or you were just about ready to, that's what those photo is. That is a picture of porcupine quills. So um, when porcupines get scared, um, one of the things that they can do is they can erect their quills. A lot of people think they can shoot them out of their body. They can't do that. That's a myth. Um, they simply erect them um, to make them stand up and that they're a little more um, in your face and kind of pokey. So um, another thing that they animals have body coverings for is camouflage. Um, a great example of this is if you've ever seen a deer. Um, deer have very kind of brownish colors, maybe dark, maybe some white, maybe some black on them. It really helps them blend into their environment because they are a prey species. Whether they are running from a bobcat or a coyote or a mountain lion or a hunter, um, they use their coat to camouflage into their environment. Another thing is that animals um, use the sensory perception. Um, so one of the things that I always like to talk to people about is a lot of fish. Um, one of the things that they have is this something called a lateral line. So it was actually a line that goes across their body um, that helps them kind of sense where they are in their environment and they can kind of pick up some magnet, magnetic um, uh, fields in the water and it helps to guide them and it kind of helps them know where things are. Um, another thing is also whiskers. So if you have a cat or a dog or a ferret or a fox or something like that, you'll notice that they have whiskers. They help with sensory as well. Um, another thing is locomotion. So animals like snakes, um, they use their scales to help push them and guide them through the grass or the sand. Um, and then also bird feathers. Feathers are a huge reason um, birds have them is to fly. So um, they aid in that locomotion as well. And then another thing is they keep an animal from drying out. Um, these are things like amphibian skin, which we'll talk about here later. If you've ever touched like a frog or a salamander, they're very slimy and wet. Um, those are that body covering that they have helps them from drying out. Um, same thing with snake scales as well. All right, so why are animals then colored sometimes or colored that the way they are? Um, so body coverings, they help animals hide. Um, sometimes they might be camouflaged like a deer or they could even have some stripes and spots that help them look like leaves or underbrush depending on where those animals are living. Um, it can also help confuse or even surprise predators. Um, some animals like a lot of moths, <clears throat> they will have something called eye spots. Um, so they look like eyes and um, and this helps animals either confuse other animals so they don't get eaten or it could surprise them and scare them away as well. Um, one good example is a meadowlark stripes. Um, a lot of the times when you see an animal, um, you think, wow, I, I really can see that animal. Like, why does it have bright yellow on it? Or why does it have stripes that I can see it really easily? Um, it might look really conspicuous to us, but to other animals and other environments, they might be totally camouflaged. Um, there's also not very many solid colored animals, um, just because the things in the environment, they're not gonna be usually a solid color. There's lots of different colors and patterns and textures, and that animal needs to blend into that area. And then there's also colors that are really bright. Um, for instance, a lot of wasps and bees, um, they're bright yellow, they're bright black, that's a warning. Um, a lot of things like um, poison dart frogs, they're going to be very brightly colored and that's a warning to other animals. Same thing with monarch butterflies, they taste really bad, and even skunks. Um, they're not necessarily a bright color, but they're very hard to miss, hence you know when there's a skunk around. All right, so do we have any questions before we go ahead and dive into mammals? Um, Nothing in the chat here, Monica. Awesome. That hopefully means I'm doing good things here. All right. So we'll go ahead and dive into mammals. So we're going to go ahead and talk about um, their body covering. So a lot of times I hear people call hair and fur kind of the same thing. Um, Technically and chemically, yeah, they're the same thing. They're both made of keratin, um, but normally what we use to describe um, fur is for non-human mammals. We know that we're mammals. We just have a, we are a little bit different than things like a squirrel or a fox. Um, and then hair is reserved for human mammals. So people, um, the exception sometimes, because it's biology, there's always an exception. Um, like a pig or an elephant, they have very coarse and very sparse hair. Sometimes people then refer to it as hair and not fur. Um, with mammals, no other creature possesses true hair or fur. That is something um, characteristically special about mammals. So again, that identifying feature. Um, and hair and fur is found on all mammals at some time during their life. 
that's how you know that they're a mammal. So why do they have hair? Why not scales or feathers? Um, so hair insulates. Um, this river otter is a great example. Um, river otters in Nebraska, they do not hibernate. You can see them in the wintertime. And like this picture, it snows um, and the ice gets in the water and it gets very cold. Um, they can have almost a million little hairs per square inch of their body, um, which helps is really compact and it insulates them and it protects them to keep them warm. Um, it also is for protection. Um, the thicker the hair um, or the more hair that they have, it protects them when they're running and they don't get scratched or they um, step on things and it helps protect their, their feet. It also helps them to conceal. So again, that camouflage element. Um, signal, like a white-tailed deer, their white tails, if they, um, flare up their tails. That usually means it's a warning that they need to run away. It helps them sense their surroundings. It also protects their skin from abrasions. And then something that people also don't think about is that excessive UV radiation. So just like people, animals can also get sunburned. Um, one of the problems that we have um, with in uh, Nebraska is that we have a lot of animals like coyotes and foxes. They get what's called sarcoptic mange. Um, so it makes their hair fall out, which doesn't really seem like that big of a deal. A lot of people don't have hair. Um, however, when it gets really hot out, they get sunburned because they have nothing to protect them. When it gets really cold outside, they're gonna freeze because they have nothing to insulate their body. All right, so what exactly is hair? Um, so hair grows out of your skin in places called follicles. Um, the root then is at the very, very base of the hair. And that is actually the po point that it's sunk into the skin. Um, the part that you see your hair on your arms, on your legs, on your head, um, that part is known as the shaft and it is made up of um, keratin. So very similar to, well, it is similar to the stuff that's on your fingernails and your toenails. It just looks a little bit different. Um, oftentimes these follicles or hair follicles will be next to what we call those um, sebaceous glands and those glands release um, kind of an oily substance that helps lubricate the hair and condition it. Um, for people, it's a little bit different because we don't have as much um, as like an otter or a fox or something like that. And then um, most mammals will have two different types of hair. Um, they have something called guard hairs and something called under fur. So those types of hairs, um, the first one is gonna be guard hairs. Uh, the best example that I can think of is if you've ever touched a deer, um, their hair is very coarse. Those are great guard hairs, what you see out there. Um, they're modified sometimes even in some animals um, to form things like defensive spines, like quills in a porcupine, um, bristles, um, sometimes like in the mane of a lion, they're a little bit different, and something called ons, um, which are hairs that don't grow continuously. Our hair grows continuously, those do not. And then um, another great example is if you've ever seen a beaver pelt. Um, one of the cool things is if you look at the top layer of the beaver pelt, you see those guard hairs. And if you ever so slightly blow into the pelt, um, it will blow those guard hairs away. And there's all this really um, very, very soft and fuzzy under fur. Um, so that is really what is insulating them. There's also something called whiskers, which a lot of you are familiar with if you have cats or dogs um, or pets in your house. Um, these are very, very long and stiff and straight. Um, the great example here in this fox, um, these are very sensitive to touch and it helps them kind of give them information about their surroundings. And one thing that I found that was really neat is this little diagram up here. Um, you can see the thickness of the hairs um, in different animals. So humans, dogs, if you look at that deer, that was very, very thick hair. Um, rabbits a little bit different, cats are different, mice are gonna be different too. Um, but it, the deer is really cool because it is thick and compact hair. All right, so all animals will shed um, periodically, most of them, um, except for people, um, they do it in a process called molting. Um, so humans, we replace our hairs continuously. Um, so if you brush your hair and you see a few hairs um, left in that hairbrush, we lose about 50 to 100 hairs every single day. Um, we don't really notice it um, until it starts um, <clears throat> uh, growing back and then you lose some more. Um, animals do it a little differently. They replace them during certain times of the year or certain times of the animal's life um, and all of their hair is replaced. 
Um, sometimes this results in a really dramatic color display. Um, for instance, our least weasels, um, in the summertime, they're going to be brown. And then in the wintertime, they're going to look like this, this white color. Um, so this helps them just blend into their environment more. Um, usually there's snow in the winter and they um, blend in more when they're white. Um, most species will also have like a distinct juvenile coat and sometimes even a sub-adult coat. And then it will look completely different sometimes when they reach that adult age. Not always, but some animals, some mammals will do have that. All right, so how do animals get their color of their hair? A lot of it is genetic, um, but how does that happen? So there's these special proteins called melanin. We have it as well. The more melanin you have in your skin, the little bit darker it's going to be. Um, so there's two different types. There's something called a eumelanin, which is going to make the skin or the hair very dark. Um, there's also something called a pheomelanin, which is going to be a little bit paler in color. Um, most hairs, so if you look at a single hair on an animal, they're going to have alternating bands of both light and dark, and we call that an agouti, um, which is funny because that's also another mammal, um, kind of like a little rodent. Um, white hairs, they're going to lack that pigmentation, and then totally black hair, that means that there's a dominance of that eumelanin because that is what makes it very dark. Um, the overall color of an animal's fur, though, it just depends on the individual bands itself, the size of the band, so are they really thick black, are they really thick white, um, and then the distribution of those hairs. So you're going to have a lot of dark colors by the tail, like this coyote here. Um, the fur is a little bit redder when it comes down to by their uh, feet, but then also it's going to be a little bit more red on their ears and on their face. So it, it's a lot of it is genetics, but it's that melanin that really uh, makes a difference in that hair color. All right, so that's what we got for mammals. There's a lot more that I could go through, but given the time frame that we do, um, we're just trying to give you a little bit um, of each kind of animal. So um, anything in the chat or Laura? Um, we do have a very interesting question. Um, is deer velvet considered hair or fur, or is it just like a skin membrane? Oh, that's a good question. <clears throat> I think um, technically they are hairs. Um, but they're weird hairs because they grow and then um, they change, they, they fall off, obviously. The deer will rub them off. Um, I, I think they're just a modified keratin, which is that hair. I'm not exactly sure, but I, that's what I assume. That's a good question. All right. All right, well, let's keep moving on. So next we're gonna go ahead and talk about birds. Um, birds have feathers, hopefully everyone knew that. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and talk about what those do for the birds. All right, so why do birds have feathers? Um, birds are the only animals in the world to have feathers. Um, so this is a huge um, <clears throat> characteristic of those animals. They're usually light, but they're pretty tough. Um, they also help keep birds warm in cold conditions if they need them. It, they help birds fly. They help them stay dry. It, they could help them blend in or stand out. It helps them attract mates. Um, and then every single feather um, helps serve an important role on that bird's body. So we're going to talk about the different types of feathers as well. Um, so when you look at a feather, the main structure of that feather, um, they're actually highly diverse, um, depending on where they're found on the bird's body. Um, but they are all composed of that beta keratin. So the same stuff that's made out of our hair and our fingernails and the hair of mammals and the fur of mammals. Same stuff, it's just modified for different species. Um, so on a feather, the main very kind of end part here where it would connect to the bird. That's sometimes called the shaft or the calamus is sometimes what people call it. Um, it extends overall into the end of the feather. And then a lot of people will call that the rachis. Um, this is what will have the branches off of it. And then when you look at even smaller, there's barbs, there's barbules, there's hooklets, um, when you really get into like looking at a feather. Uh, feathers are technically dead structures and they cannot repair themselves. Uh, so each year birds will shed those old feathers, um, they will molt and they will regrow new ones. All right, so how do feathers actually grow from a bird? Um, so here's a cool little diagram. This is how it happens, and I didn't even know this. Um, so each year, um, or each new feather that the bird gets, it kind of starts as almost like a little bump on the bird's uh, body. Depending on the species, some birds start naked and some birds start with a little fuzz. Just depends on their um, 
genetics and where they're living and the species of bird. Um, so that little um, growth of skin then is called the papilla. Um, and then as they mature, those tips get pushed away and they get a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger. And then as they develop, they will start to branch depending on where they're being found on that bird's body. And then those protect, that protective sheath um, will actually maintain the shape of the feather. And then once that feather is fully grown, it will kind of fall off and then the feather is ready to go. It's a full fled, full fledged feather. All right, so what are the types of feathers on the body here? Um, we have some different types. Um, the main one that we're gonna talk about um, is the, the first one you see here, that very, very large one, that is gonna be <clears throat> your flight feather. Um, sorry, your tail feather and then your flight feather. Um, so the wing feathers, they're specialized for flight. They're a certain shape, they're a certain aerodynamic, um, and they're also gonna be asymmetrical because that is what's helping the bird fly. Um, the tail feathers, they're usually arranged in a fan. Um, so think of a turkey, when you see a turkey fan, um, they are they actually will support that precision steering. So those are the flight feathers that help the bird steer in midair. Even turkeys that are really not the most graceful flyers, they do fly, um, it helps all birds that fly do that. Um, so if you're a bird that doesn't really fly, you don't need super specialized tail feathers. And then the contour feathers, this is what you see that mostly covers the bird's body. Um, they're usually overlapping, kind of like shingles. Um, and then the really fluffy part is attached to closer to the bird's body because that is what helps um, keep them warm. And normally they could be brightly colored, they could be drab, again, depending on the species and the sex of the bird. All right, there's also something called a semi-plume. We're kind of going down in size here. Um, semi-plume is mostly hidden beneath the other ones. You can't really see them. Um, they're very fluffy feathers. If you look back here, the semi-plume is gonna be a uh, number, I think it is number, number four is a phyloplume. So I think it's number five on here. They just get smaller and smaller. And then the down feathers, so downy feathers. Um, if you have um, a pillow that has real like goose feathers or chicken feathers in it, um, this is gonna be those little tiny ones that poof out of it every once in a while. Um, <clears throat> these have a very loose uh, structure on them. They trap the body heat. They are mostly there for warmth. And then the phyloplume, these are gonna be the very, very thin uh, feathers. They're very simple. They have very few barbs. Uh, they're very similar in function to like a mammal whisker. This helps them sense the position of the contour feathers and it will actually help them in flight as well. They're just kind of very small. All right, there are something called display feathers. Um, in some birds, not all birds have these, um, but some of them will actually have certain body parts like tail feathers, like the bird of paradise or this wood duck. Um, they have modified feathers on top of their head um, that they will use in courtship displays. Um, so a lot of the times they can erect them, like the male wood duck here that I have a picture. Um, they elevate them by using muscle contractions. Um, so to get that girl, they might put it up and the girl will look at them and be like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Um, some birds use them as a um, display of an aggression. Um, so blue jays are a good example. If you ever watch blue jays out your kitchen window or your feeder, you notice they have those little crests on top of their head. Um, they will actually, when they're aggr aggressive or being irritated, they will erect their crest on top of their head because that is their way of saying, okay, um, I'm aggressive, get away from me, this is my area. And then when they're with their family or their bird friends, they usually do not have that up because there's no reason to be aggressive towards them. All right, some feathers are waterproof. Um, depending on the species, again, a robin doesn't really need to have waterproof feathers because they don't swim a lot. Um, things like a loon or a duck, they need those waterproof feathers. Um, so what they will do is the contour feathers, the ones that you mostly see on the um, around the bird's body, they're going to be arranged so that those tips um, ex are exposed. Um, this helps the water basically roll off the bird's back and they maintain this kind of uh, waterproofing by grooming or preening. They do this a lot. If you've ever watched birds, um, they're very clean animals and they constantly are doing this to reshape their feathers. Um, and then once those feathers 
kind of can't be reshaped anymore, they lose them and then molt and get new ones. Um, even the smallest um, disruption of this interlocking structure um, can leave the birds unable to fly because they're waterlogged. Um, so a lot of the times you will see 90% of the time you'll see birds cleaning themselves. That's because they need to keep their feathers clean and they need to keep them in order and they need to keep them um, kind of tidy, I guess, so that things like that don't happen. All right, that was all for birds. Do we have any questions? None in the chat. Okay. All right, so we're going to move on to reptiles then. Um, these guys have totally different structures and um, I always kind of joke about this, but I can't really do a science of without talking about reptiles. I think I've put them in almost every single one. So here's another uh, talk about reptiles. So reptiles are going to have scales. They have dry scales, which are going to be a little bit different than our fish that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, Reptiles are not slimy. When you go to touch them, uh, people always say, I don't want to touch them. They're slimy. They're not. Um, they are dry scales. Um, they're dry to the touch and they're made from that similar protein, the human fingernails, rhino horns, bird feet. Scales are made of keratin, same stuff that's on your fingernails. Um, a lot of people believe that the scales are actually the reptile skin. This is not true. The skin actually lies underneath those scales. Uh, there's a lot of different types of scales and patterns, colors. Um, we'll talk about a few here in a little bit. Um, but the main reason that reptiles have scales is because over time they've adapted to living in a lifestyle that is not aquatic and they needed some way to hold in that water um, so they don't dehydrate or it doesn't get evaporated. So hence the scales. Um, frogs they have the same problem, but they don't have scales. They have to do it a little bit differently. Um, one thing, we don't have them obviously here in Nebraska, we don't have uh, crocodiles or alligators, um, but that is the best uh, example that I can give for what we call osteoderms or osteoscoots. These are going to be extremely hard bony plates um, in the dermis layer of the skin. Um, if you've ever traveled to Florida and seen an alligator or a crocodile, um, a lot of people say the most dangerous part of an alligator or crocodile is its tail. Most people would think, well, the teeth, duh. Um, yes, but the tail is extremely hard and it, they can whip it around. And those osteoderms or scoots are made of complete dense bone. So if it hits you, it's gonna knock you off um, or knock an animal off its feet as well. Um, they're usually located on the back and the sides and the tail of the animal, um, not necessarily near the face or anything like that. It would make them too heavy. All right, there's two different types of scales and I had a really hard time finding a good picture of the second one. So kind of bear with me here. Um, the two types of scales for snakes at least are gonna be smooth and keeled scales. So smooth scales are gonna be very reflective. They're very iridescent and kind of pretty. Um, and they look like they kind of perfectly puzzle piece fit together. Um, that top picture here is smooth scales. And then the bottom picture, the hog nose that you see, they have what we call keeled scales. Um, so when you look at a scale, every single individual scale has a line or a ridge down it, um, and that makes them really rough. Um, they often kind of flare out sometimes too, and then people sometimes say they look kind of feathery. Um, no one is really sure why some snakes have which. Um, some scientists even believe that it's kind of just the luck of the draw, um, just how some people have um, straight hair versus curly hair. Um, just some species have this and some species have keeled. So it kind of just depends. Um, body scales are gonna be very closely packed together and um, they actually ar ar arrange themselves in an organizational pattern. Um, the top scales are also going to look very different than the ventral or the belly scales. Um, so top scales are kind of very small and kind of circular or uh, cylindrical. The ones on the bottom are going to be sometimes even rectangular. Um, they kind of line up together like bricks. Um, so those belly scales are also going to be a lot smoother so that that animal can glide um, either on sand, on the grass, wherever they're traveling to. Some scales and some animals um, even have um, little decorative things. Um, this is <clears throat> an eyelash viper. And if you notice kind of up by their eyes, they have these two little scales that poke out. Um, those are really kind of mild. There are some like the tentacled snake you can look at um, that have almost like octopus tentacles coming out. And those are all just modified scales. 
All right, something that all snakes do, um, and um, people do this too, we just don't do it as large or all at once, um, <clears throat> but we do shed our skin and snakes will do this too. Um, in a fancy way of saying it, we say ectysis. Um, so basically uh, when the snake becomes too big for the skin that it has, it can't grow any further. So that animal knows, okay, it's time to shed. And it just kind of depends on the snake's environment. Um, if it's not getting a lot of food or if it's overeating, it's going to shed quicker. Um, if it's been really hot or really wet, it might shed differently. It just kind of depends. Um, a lot of people's snakes that they have in captivity will also shed more um, than snakes in the wild. So our, I think our snake uh, probably sheds like 12 times a year, about once a month or so. Um, usually in the wild, it's maybe two to four times a year. So very different. Um, when they're ready to shed their skin, usually what they will do is they'll head to water. It kind of helps loosen it up and they will uh, create a rip in their skin. Um, it's usually in uh, by their mouth or their nose. They rub it up against a rock or a log or their water bowl. It will break the skin and then they just kind of shimmy out of it. Um, when you find a snake skin, it actually comes off inside out. So if you're lazy and you take your socks off, it's kind of the same concept. All right. I know we're kind of flying through this. We still got amphibians and, and um, insects and fish to talk about. So uh, do we have any questions? None in the chat. I have a feeling everyone's saving them for the end. I know. Good. Maybe I'm just answering everything hopefully pretty well. So, all right. We'll talk about amphibians. Uh, these guys are a little different. Um, they're moist and slimy. So when people say, oh, I don't want to touch it, it's slimy. Yes, you are absolutely correct. They are moist and slimy. Um, so they have this permeable skin that allows gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide to come in and out of their skin. This is what helps them breathe. So they actually do breathe through their skin. Um, these guys can lose a lot of water uh, through their skin. So that's a lot of times why when you find frogs and toads and salamanders, they're usually by a water source. They can't go too far from it. Toads are a little different. Um, you might find them in some kind of rocky um, areas or a little bit farther away from water. They have those really bumpy kind of warts on their body. That helps that water stay inside. But like a true like bullfrog or a tree frog, they have to be by water. They can only survive a certain time without it. Um, most of the time, this is what helps to protect them, um, and, but they will also secrete a mucus um, through glands in their skin. Um, this helps them to kind of maintain that salt and water balance when they're in the water and when they're out of the water. So if um, amphibians are out of the water for a while, they might secrete this really slimy mucus. That's basically their last resort to keep a bunch of water in and to keep their body moist and not dehydrate and not kind of mummify themselves. Um, one of the things that we have found, though, um, with our frogs, um, a lot, you might have heard about a lot of mass extinctions of amphibians. One of the main things that we have this issue is because of something called chytrid fungus. Um, so basically what happens is it's a fungus, um, which scientists believe that's been here a long time, and then it kind of died down. But what's happening now is they think with the climate being a little bit warmer in certain areas, this fungus is kind of coming back to life and it's um, thriving now in this hotter humidity and um, the different climate now. Um, but what happens is when a a uh, fungus attacks these frogs or these amphibians, it causes their skin to become very thick. Um, doesn't sound like a big deal, but then they can't uptake that oxygen and pass through those gases. So basically it makes it really hard for those amphibians to breathe and to transport those minerals and nutrients from their body. Um, it's really common in amphibians. Um, when you see it, it's going to, they're going to be very lethargic. Their skin might even be kind of a reddish pink color. This picture here is a great example. They are not normally like that. Um, so if you turn them over and they have that pinky red color and they're very lethargic and they're tired and they kind of feel heavy, they might have chytrid. Um, it has been found in Nebraska. Um, once a place is infected, this is a sad part, it stays in that water forever. So it is always a good idea when we tell people if you're traveling to streams or if you're in boats or waters or anything like that, wash your shoes, um, wash your boat, wash your equipment. Um, that's so that it doesn't pass from um, water spot to water spot. All right, that's all we got for um, amphibians. So I see something about what do sharks have? We will get there. So I will answer your question, Ethan, here hopefully in a second. So, all right. 
So insects, insects are a little bit different. Um, they have something called what we call an exoskeleton. So exo just means external. Um, so they have an external skeleton. We are endoskeleton animals, which means our skeleton hopefully is on the inside of your body. Um, so that inside body wall of an insect, it, when you look at it, it kind of looks like a, a tube. They don't have any bones. They have this boneless tube that has ridges and knobs that help strengthen it. And then it has little places of attachment for like their antennas and their muscles and their joints and their legs. Um, this exoskeleton offers protection from predators, um, from parasites, and oftentimes um, if it gains a lot of excess water or if it has a lot of excess water loss. All right, so most of the time when I think of exoskeletons, I think of cicadas. You always find these in the summer. Um, this is a great example of one that has been molted and shed, and that little cicada then is off doing something else in a bigger exoskeleton. So there's some different um, parts of the exoskeleton. Um, <clears throat> the first one is called the epicuticle. So the insect's first and last line of defense is this epicuticle. It's covered by a wax, and then another layer keeps that wax intact. So it basically holds everything together. Uh, the procuticle has two layers and it covers the outside of the insect, but also the dig digestive tracts um, and the breathing system as well. Um, this is where the insect's color is found. Um, so in that kind of middle layer. And then there's something called the epidermis, which we also have on our skin, and the hypodermis. So this is the living cellular layer that has the non-living cuticle above it. Um, this is what has all the sensory hairs, and then it pokes through the cuticle. And this also helps with the animal to get their information. So it's very similar to whiskers. All right, so exoskeleton is made of chitin, um, which is a derivative of glucose, so sugar. Um, it can be very flexible or it could be very stiff, depending on what species of insect it is on and what the animal is using it for. Um, the muscle attachments um, are made from that stretchy chitin stuff. It is six times stronger than our human tendons. So it is a very um, rough and a very uh, strong substance. And exoskeletons, they can't grow. So for an insect, when they grow bigger, they have to molt and shed that exoskeleton and then get larger. So how do they molt? So the epidermis will actually build a new epicuticle layer and exocuticle layer around the old one. Basically, they separate themselves. Um, the insect will take all the stuff that it needs from the old one and recycle it through its body to build that new, um, <clears throat> that new layer or that new exoskeleton. Um, when they're ready to shed, ex um, insects, they will pump um, their head up and their thorax with air, and that increases their blood pressure. And then basically the skin will just split at the weakest point. And that new animal will then be able to pull itself out if you've ever watched a cicada shed its exoskeleton, it's really fascinating and it's very cool. Um, at this point, when they come out of their exoskeleton, their old one, they're very vulnerable. Um, this is when a lot of times they don't move. It's exhausting to do this. Um, and they're very squishy, actually, if you touch them. Um, and then what will happen is that their exoskeleton will harder um, get hardened in a couple of hours. So at this point, they have to be very careful. This is when they're most vulnerable to a predator, something that wants to eat them. All right, we got one more. I know it's a lot of information this week, um, so it might be a little bit longer than some of the other ones we've had before, but um, any questions or anything like that? We did have a quick question about clarifying that crabs do have exoskeletons, so like crustaceans and mollusks. And they do, like yes. That. Yep, good question. Um, I also see someone ask, how long can the fungus live on your shoes? Um, I'm guessing you're talking about that chytrid fungus. It could live on your shoes for days, weeks, um, could be years. Um, for instance, if you wear boots once a year and you um, get out of the water, you put them up in the garage and then you come back a year later, it could still be on your boots. So we always tell people, um, especially with those invasive pathogens and fungus um, and even like things like <clears throat> uh, zebra mussels, wash your boats, wash your shoes. Um, very, very easy thing to do. Just some warm water or even cool water and like Dawn dish soap. So very, very easy thing to do. All right. Last one. We're going to talk about fish. 
All right, so fish also have scales. They're just not dry like a snake. Um, scales are very, very diverse in fish. Um, some fish don't even have scales. Um, so the primary pur purpose of scales in fish is just that external protection. It also gives them their color um, and it also can help them protect them from their environment. Um, some species even will have more than one type of scale on the same body of that fish. So their head scale might be completely different than their tail scales. Um, even females and males, different sexes of the same species will have different types of scales. Um, same type of fish, but just females will have this kind, males will have this kind. So what are the different types of scales? There's four main ones. And there's something called a placoid scale, a cycloid scale, a ganoid scale, and a tenoid scale. <clears throat> so there's a couple different um, examples here. We'll go through them really quick. So sharks, I saw someone ask the question, what kind of scales do sharks have? They're a little bit different. They have something called a placoid scale. We'll get into those. Um, cycloid scales are going to be like your trout and your salmon. Um, gunoid scales are things like a gar. And then your tenoid scales are going to be things like uh, sunfish. So all have different purposes, all made of different um, types of materials, and they all attach to the body very differently. All right, so for instance, those placoid scales like found on a shark, these are things like sharks and rays. Um, they don't increase as the fish grows, um, but instead new scales are just going to be added between the old ones. They're very flat and rectangular, um, and these can also develop into different spines. Um, in some rays, um, they will have spines as well. Um, one thing that's really neat is I couldn't find a good picture that was a um, public domain one, but if you Google search um, shark scales uh, in a magnifying lens or under a microscope, they look very, very cool. Um, by the way, I would highly suggest looking at those. And then cycloid scales, so smooth edge scales. Um, these are ones that are going to be found in your trout and your salmon and your carp. Um, these are very large and they're overlapping um, and they allow for greater flexibility and movement in those animals. Um, sometimes people will use these to make jewelry. They get very large, um, especially like your common carp scales. Um, not the best fish in the world, but they do have very large scales um, that you can kind of take off as well if you ever caught them to eat, for instance. All right, gunoid scales. These are gonna be things like your bowfin, which is like a picture that I have here because no one knows what a bowfin is. Um, paddlefish, the ones with the very, very large snouts on them. Gars, sturgeons have these. Um, they're gonna be a weird shape. They're gonna be a rhombus. If you remember to like second grade, what a rhombus looks like in shape. Um, and then they have these cool peg and socket joints um, between the layers. And they're actually made out of something called bone salt. Um, I'll let you go ahead and look that up since we're kind of running out of time here, um, but just kind of the uh, composition of those scales is very primitive. The things that you have like um, sturgeons, gars, paddlefish, they're very primitive old dinosaur-like fish, so these are kind of primitive old scales that go along with them. And then we have our tenoid scales. These are going to be a little bit more modern, a little bit more progressive, um, found in your perch and your sunfish. They have cone-like teeth. Um, on the overlapping edges, which allow for really great flexibility. If you've ever watched a sunfish or a perch, they can move very quickly and fast and they can move their body um, almost like fish yoga. So they're very great flexibility and good movement. Um, that surface layer of the scale is made up of calcium and salt. And then the inner layer of that scale is collagen, which a lot of people will use that to fill um, sometimes for like plastic surgery and stuff. So that's the same stuff that's made out of those fish scales. All right, so that was a ton of information. There was a lot to talk about today. So I, I know we're a little longer than normal, um, but does anyone have any good questions? Um, I can go ahead and, and stop sharing my screen here so I can see everybody. All right, do we have any questions or anything like that? Or did I answer everything perfectly? I don't know. Lots of information, but it was really good. All right. Well, really quick then, I did forget something here. I will show you really fast. <clears throat> um, make sure you join us next week um, for our third episode of The Science Of. We're going to be talking all about turtles. Um, so uh, some cool turtles. We're going to have some friends joining us. Um, 
probably have heard the one behind me. He's been really loud today, um, but I have a little snapping turtle back here. His name's Chomper. Um, so we're going to talk all about turtles, their beaks, their um, different types of shells, the difference between a turtle and a tortoise, um, all these really cool things. So um, please join us next week, same time, uh, Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, it will have a different link, and it is a, a pre-registration just like you did today. Um, so you can find that on our Game and Parks Facebook page or on our Project Wild Facebook page. Um, and then here's a list of the next four weeks that we're going to do. So um, it'll be every Thursday from now until February 18th. Um, Science of turtles, mosses and lichens, threatened and endangered species. And then our last one, wetlands, we're actually going to have um, Ted LaGrange, who is our wetland biologist here at Game on Parks, and then Grace Gard, who is our aquatic education specialist, join me um, to talk about wetlands. So I won't be doing a lot of talking that day. I'm going to let the actual experts talk to me about wetlands. So. All right, so thank you everyone. Um, I can stick around for a little bit here if you have any questions. Um, next week we're going to be talking about turtles. My daughter knows the word turtles and she goes turtles. So that's how I kind of always say it now. Um, someone asked if this recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Yes, it will be on the Nebraska Game and Parks mm -hmm. Education YouTube channel. Um, give us probably till the end of the day tomorrow and it will be up there. Um, you can just go to the playlist and search science of and you can find all of them on there. So all of them will be recorded and put on there as well. So, all right. Well, that's great. I guess we didn't have a lot of questions this week. So um, hopefully I answered everyone or everyone's just so overwhelmed with all the information that might be it too. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I can stick around if we, if anyone has any other questions. Um, otherwise, we'll see you next week, Thursday, three o'clock. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Laura, as well. Thank you. Not a problem. We did have a quick question. I don't know if she's still here. Oh yeah. Carol Johnson asked if dolphins have skin. They do. Yes. They are one of those weird mammals. Um, so they do actually have fur, but um, that's really that coarse, very fine fur. So we'll probably call it hair. Um, but yes, they do have um, a skin on them. Good question. All right. <clears throat> well, thanks everyone. Thanks Laura again, and we'll see you next week.